Everywhere we look, the world is busy. People are rushing around expending energy. Sometimes we reach for a can of Red Bull as a pick-me-up, a speed boost to get us through a long drive or a study session. But have you ever stopped to think about where Red Bull came from? Or what's inside the can? Or the fact that those bulls on the front of the can are actually wild gur, Indian bison, the world's largest bovine species native to Southeast Asia. From a duck farmer to a convict that's led to possibly one of the most well-known sports brands, this is the story of Red Bull. Here's how it happened. First things first, Red Bull. The drink that many of us know and love wasn't a new invention. The original product is called Kreting Dang, which was introduced in Thailand in 1976 by Chalio Uvidya, a Chinese entrepreneur. And before we get into the beast that is Red Bull GmbH, it's important to look at its origins. The inventor, Chalio, was the son of poor Chinese immigrants who raised ducks in rural Thailand. In the 1950s, Chalio moved to Bangkok to sell pharmaceuticals and wound up launching his own antibiotic manufacturing business called TC Pharmaceuticals in 1956. Despite focusing on pharmaceuticals for 20 years, he began to notice a trend linked to industrialization within Thailand which saw people seek out energy drinks to become more productive and work longer hours. It got Chalio thinking. At the time, in 1976, there was only one major competitor, a Japanese drink called Lipovitan D. Chalio saw the popularity of Lipovitan and decided to tweak the recipe to make a sweeter version of the syrup to create his own drink which he called Kreting Dang, which literally translates to Red Bull. His marketing strategy was simple. He first focused on inland Thailand rather than in the main cities where his competitors were. The logo of two bison charging together matched the bull fights that were popular in the rural areas. Within two years, the branding and marketing had pushed Kreting Dang to become the country's best-selling energy drink. Kreting Dang therefore helped the rural farmers transition to more urban jobs during the industrialization period with truck drivers among the first people to really boost the drink's popularity. He then began promoting the energy drink to fans of Mai Tai, and the drink brand soon became associated with the sport due to the fact that Kreting Dang sponsored high-profile fighters and events. The sporting connection remains to this day. But the man who transformed it into a global superpower is an individual called Dietrich Mateschitz, or Mr. Red Bull. At the time, Chalio's company, TC Pharmaceuticals, was working with importing products from a German toothpaste manufacturer called Blendax. But when Blendax's marketing director, Dietrich Mateschitz, found that a bottle of Kreting Dang cured his jet lag, he sought out Chalio to strike a deal with a view to taking this drink to the Western world through another corporation, which they eventually set up in 1984, called Red Bull GmbH. They changed the name to Red Bull which was deemed to be more suitable for an English-speaking Western world, but kept much of the core ingredients and flavors, but making the drastic change of carbonating the drink to make the taste more appealing. Adding fizz also teed it up for an alcoholic mixer that many of us will have used today. They ditched the medicine-like bottles to switch to silver and blue cans and changed the target market from low-income earners to upmarket new money party animals and adventure seekers. The issue, however, was at the time of launch there was no market for energy drinks in Europe, and there was no real need for them. People didn't really know what they were missing. The Austrian government were also quite scared about the potential risk of addiction to taurine or caffeine. You have to remember that in Asia, these drinks were sold in pharmacies, almost like a medicine. Therefore, Red Bull had to pass a significant number of scientific tests before the cans would hit the supermarket shelves. Red Bull had to wait until these were completed before they could market their product in 1987, three years later. They also had significant issues with bottling their product, with many Austrian businesses refusing to work with Red Bull. Fortunately, Rauch, the largest producer of cans and containers in Austria, gave life to the can we all know today. Then Mateschitz ran into the taste issue. In Asia, energy drinks weren't fizzy, so they were more like cough syrup than a soft drink, hence the reason for carbonating Red Bull. But Red Bull still struggled to shift their product because of a lack of demand. 
It was only when clubbers started promoting Red Bull as an alcoholic mixer to be drank at parties and clubs to give people the energy to dance all night. Did Red Bull really get their wings and they'd finally created a market as demand started to catch up with supply? Within their first year of marketing, Red Bull sold over a million cans. And two years later, it's estimated that Red Bull were selling a million cans a day. In the 1990s, Red Bull continued to soar becoming more of a status symbol that focused on sports from F1 to football to ice skating. By 1999, Red Bull was doing $1.3 billion in annual sales, and it proved to be a success with the company that Chalio and Mateschitz founded together selling tens of billions of cans to date, boasting a 43% market share in the USA. The Red Bull logo is now synonymous with energy and sporting success around the world. But there's a strange twist to the logo that not many people know. Most people see them as two red bulls, hence the name. But they're actually animals called gur, or Indian bison. Native to Southeast Asia, the gur is one of the largest land animals, and ironically, even though they're seen butting heads on many cans around the world, they're almost never seen fighting. Over the years, there have been many critics and horror stories with Red Bull, in spite of its success and meteoric rise. In 2004, France became concerned that Red Bull had too much caffeine, so they banned it completely. Only by 2008 was it allowed to be imported after four years of testing took place that couldn't find any health risks associated with the drink. In 2014, Lithuania also voted in a law that banned the sale of high caffeine drinks to minors or those under the age of 16 which spread to many other countries a few years later. Perhaps what was more strange was what happened in Germany in 2009, when Red Bull Cola was found to have trace amounts of cocaine made from a coca plant, most of the time the manufacturing process removes the cocaine component, but this time not completely. This sounds shocking, but to be fair, the German Food Safety Department found it was a negligible amount, requiring a person to chug 12,000 litres of Red Bull Cola to get any cocaine-like effects from the drink. In 2013, Red Bull got a bit high on their own supply when they went after a small brewery in Norwich who used a name similar to the Red Bull brand in Redwell Brewing, filing a lawsuit to dispute their name which could be easily confused with Red Bull, or so they say. The eight-person brewery took their name from Redwell Street in Norfolk, England and had to sit down with Red Bull to agree that they had no plans to make energy drinks in the future, with Red Bull so graciously allowing them to continue the Red Bull brand. In 2014, the tables were turned when Ben Carruthers sued Red Bull for their slogan, which he suggested was misleading, in Red Bull Gives You Wings, taking them to court as he'd been misled and hadn't grown wings. Shocker. More shocking, however, is that he won his lawsuit for Red Bull misleading customers, with his claim suggesting that Red Bull was no more effective than a cup of coffee, despite being marketed as a superior product. Red Bull settled out of court and had to pay every Red Bull consumer $10, which amounted to $13 million in total after all payments were made. Now these are quite shocking horror stories, but we've saved the best till last. In 2012, the heir to a $13 billion Red Bull fortune, Voryuth Uvidia, was accused of running a policeman over and killing him while driving his Ferrari in Bangkok. He later didn't attend court and he was detained by business, but it was found out that he wasn't away on business but exploring the world and living the high life. In 2017, he was again summoned to court in a final warning, but instead he fled the country. His passport was revoked and an arrest warrant was issued which might have meant 10 years in jail. However, he was never caught before the charges were dropped in 2020, which shows how wealth and power helped to escape the justice system. But back to Red Bull and their presence is worldwide. But despite being a beverage company, many know the business as a sporting success. From Red Bull Racing, Toro Rosso, New York Red Bulls, Red Bull Salzburg, RB Leipzig, Red Bull Air Race, Red Bull Cliff Diving, Red Bull Flugtag, and Red Bull Crashed Ice, the list is endless. They also run a high-tech training facility in California, and this extreme alter ego has given the brand a cool image which really differentiates Red Bull from other carbonated drinks brands. 
Their image and marketing success is partly the reason why the Red Bull brand is so well known today. From the Felix Baumgartner space jump, to car-sized Red Bull cans, to just handing out free Red Bulls at universities, the business has tried all sorts of guerrilla marketing techniques to stand out from the crowd. With almost 8 billion cans of Red Bulls sold worldwide in 2020 alone, which equates to around $6 billion in revenue, it's no surprise that it's one of the world's largest drinks manufacturers, with massive margins given that a single can only costs around 10 cents to produce. Red Bull gives you wings is the slogan they live by, and Red Bull truly has taken off. And that's how it happened. Thanks for watching. Thank you.